Welcome, everybody. This is Doug McCall from the International School Health Network. Welcome you to, to one of the additional webinars in our series on low-resource countries. Uh, this session is looking at promoting healthy food choices in low-resource countries. It's an open meeting. It's a, a discussion that will end up uh, will be followed by an online discussion around a summary or review that we've been preparing. Um, but I'm very pleased to uh, have received to, to notice the interest from all of the UN agencies or many of the UN agencies who have an interest in school nutrition and uh, looking forward to the open discussion we'll have. Uh, we're hoping that coming out of this we'll have a, a revised frame of, of, uh, of reference so that we can look at how we might summarize um, the materials, the research, the resources and the reports that we've found in our review um, as, as part of this outcome and then we'll follow up with a summary. We're also um, uh, seem, we seem to have got interest from a number of people for an ongoing conversation about school nutrition. Um, I'm going to uh, leave that to a uh, discussion among the four UN agencies as to if and how they want to best proceed with that, but I'm hopeful that, uh, that we can continue this conversation in some form in another way. Uh, the FRESH partnership, which brings together UN agencies on all sorts of issues, would be um, interested and willing to help participate in that, uh, but uh, each of those UN agencies have their own resources and their own uh, their own capacity to lead those discussions. So we'll leave that for a, a subsequent meeting. But welcome everybody to this session. Um, as I say, we're going to start out with our comments from the UN agencies, and I'm going to ask um, uh, Melissa to share her screen. She has Melissa has a few slides and then we'll move to the, the next uh, and, and if it's you know if you're just willing, opening up with a couple of comments that's great. Um, the topic is really how we're promoting healthy food choices in low resource countries um, and um, what the UN agencies are doing about that or planning to do about that in the near future. So Melissa do you want to um, take us through your remarks? Yes. Hey, Doug, thank you so much uh, for providing the opportunity to share some of FAO's work in this area and uh, to see what other agencies and colleagues are doing as well. So um, uh, in the interest of time, um, I will try to give a brief background of the work that we are doing in schools um, with a focus mostly on nutrition education because of the, of the topic of today's webinar. Um, so I just wanted to say that uh, historically FAO has been providing technical support to member countries in a range of technical areas uh, related to school-based programs. Uh, just to name a few, school gardens, nutrition education, uh, developing value chains, and linking smallholders to school procurement. Um, so in the context of current global nutrition situation, which I'm sure you all, you all know very well, and the global commitments to improve nutrition and food security, including the decade of action of, of nutrition and the SDGs and the recommendations from the ICN2, from the International Conference on Nutrition, um, and building upon the experiences FAO has, is, has been working for the past years to, uh, let's say, devise a corporate framework on how to go about um, school-based food and nutrition programs. Uh, this framework has been developed by a multidisciplinary task force that is based in, in headquarters, and it is mostly based on the premise that school setting um, can make a sizable impact on poverty eradication, health, education, uh, nutrition, and food security through various access points and opportunities. So we considered the life cycle approach focusing on the preschool and school years as an opportunity to promote healthy diets and investments in this area uh, not as a competition with early infancy interventions, but rather as a complementarity for sustainable gains in nutrition. It also considers a food systems approach and builds on FAO's expertise along the food system, uh, capitalizing on lessons learned of the existing country models uh, for food and nutrition interventions, and intends to build strong linkages with already existing interventions and sectorial efforts to find uh, multi-win outcomes. Um, you can hear me well, right? Yes. Okay. So this is just a, a diagram that is still in progress. Um, so this is to highlight our areas of work uh, and the way we are trying to proceed to assist countries. 
in the implementation of school food and nutrition policies and programs. So this approach links FAO's experience in healthy school meals and, and food and nutrition education, building capacity for sustainable procurement and enabling environments through multisectorial legal and policy frameworks, and to improve the li livelihoods of uh, communities and creator, create stronger nexuses between agriculture, food systems, and nutrition. Um, so we have four areas of work, uh, and this is not meant to be taken as a prescriptive model, but rather as a flexible approach that we are trying to adapt to the different situations and, and member country contexts. Mm -hmm. uh, so our four areas of focus are um, promoting healthy school food environments and healthy meals, mostly through uh, setting standards, integrating effective um, nutrition education across the whole school system, and this is the, the focus of today, uh, simulating inclusive procurement and value chains and creating an enabling uh, policy and legal environment. And we have, a, what we're trying to do is to create explicit linkages and points of entry in each of these areas of technical work. So we have a series of cross-cutting areas that I'm not going to go into, uh, but just to highlight the, the focus that we have on trying to create partnerships, and, and this is one of the, the very good things about this, this web call, that we try to see what other agencies are doing and, and to see where we can work together to avoid duplication of efforts and to understand how to exchange uh, lessons learned. So I'm just going to focus on uh, nutrition education for this, for this webinar. And we see nutrition education uh, as working towards uh, facilitating a lasting food-related not only um, knowledge, but goes beyond that, rather than outlooks, skills, and practices in school children as well as their families. So we're not trying to limit it uh, only to, to having school children learn about nutrients, uh, but rather to go beyond, uh, to empower also school actors to be agents of change in their own food systems. We work with several stakeholders, including Ministry of Education, Agriculture, Social Protection, and other partners. And uh, the support that we provide in this area is more uh, on awareness raising and advocacy, um, support for integrating uh, quality nutrition education into the school curricula and beyond the classroom, including school gardens. Uh, we provide guidance for the effective design uh, and monitoring of um, nutrition education interventions in the schools, uh, promote the active involvement of families, and, and more specifically promote explicit linkages with policies around the school, uh, school meals, uh, procurement policies, um, everything that has to do with food environment being that they already exist or are in the process of development and we provide capacity development uh, for uh, national actors. Uh, some examples of current country support in nutrition education in schools. Um, recently, we're supporting Kenya to uh, integrate nutrition education along the school curricula. In Tajikistan is similar, uh, but rather on the curricula, we are uh, supporting the integration into the training of teachers. Uh, in Latin American countries, there is a big uh, Brazil-supported program that is uh, trying to integrate nutrition education into school food, uh, school meal programs. And most recently, we are trying to support Nigeria in this comprehensive approach, including nutrition education. So um, along the way, we uh, saw that there were increasing country requests for technical support, but that there were a lot of um, gaps and evidence gaps when it came to low- and middle-income countries. So for example, the criteria for success of nutrition education um, was not um, agreed and understood by all. Uh, the approaches to have effective interventions were not very clear or very well um, evidenced on low- and middle-income countries, which specific linkages of nutrition education with the school environment and beyond are, are the most effective, and 
uh, the evidence is very limited uh, besides beyond high income countries about the effective methods, the pathways, uh, the sustainability of existing uh, nutrition education models. We discovered that many of the traditional models are based on information dissemination, which uh, we understand that are not conducive to healthier practices or food choices. So based on this, um, we uh, began an area of work last year, and the basis for this area of work was an expert consultation uh, where about 63 experts from all over the world, um, we uh, came together and we tried to understand what are the main challenges in this area for low and middle income countries. Um, we had, uh, we're currently developing four main outputs uh, of this consultation and that will guide FAO's work for the next years in this area, which includes a white paper on the principles uh, of effectiveness of nutrition education interventions in schools with a focus in low and middle income countries a capacity needs assessment tool to understand what are the capacities needed throughout the school system to have effective um, interventions being in the curricula, being integrated in the school meal programs, uh, understanding what is the capacity development opportunities for teachers and for other educators, not only teachers, including um, nurses and people from NGOs that are normally um, uh, um, implementing projects at school level to understand which are, are the materials that are needed to understand which is already there and what are not being used and what are the models. A, a review of the evidence based specifically on what works in low and middle income countries and then a global survey which we have a 30 countries to understand what Hey, how many hours do they dedicate to nutrition education in the curriculum? Who are the main frontline educators? What are the models that they use? Uh, what are the basis of their uh, um, findings? Uh, what is, is what are the main topics that they are interested in, and what are the, their needs, of course? Um, so this consultation, um, we, as I said, we had active participation of more than 60 experts across the globe. Uh, we defined the research needs and we prioritized them regarding um, nutrition education and behavior change in, in, L, in low and middle income countries. Um, we collected feedback and did an expert validation of this white paper that I was mentioning. Uh, we had a very long discussion on food literacy, which is also part of one of the fresh working groups. To understand if food literacy is a goal, is the long-term goal of nutrition education or if it goes beyond, um, we identified potential partnerships and networking opportunities. And most importantly, we identified promotional and advocacy strategies for raising visibility of nutrition education in schools because we saw that even if it's present on the policies of many countries, it is not being implemented. There are not, uh, the, the resources are not allocated to it. It's not based on, on evidence. It's not based on lessons learned on best practices. Um, so I just, just not to steal a lot of your time, I just wanted to mention what our, are the, um, the themes of this white paper, and actually one of the writers and the coordinator of this white paper is here, uh, Jane Sherman, and uh, this white paper is supposed to understand what are these basic principles in eight topics uh, for setting the, the basis for our future work and for countries to and for ministries uh, to see how they can adapt these principles to their own needs, being it at national level in the curriculum or being it at program level, project level. Uh, so we have the, uh, the case and the policy uh, uh, and advocacy for nutrition education in schools. Uh, what are the enabling environments and what are the linkages with the food environment, with the home environment, and also what are the policy supports that are needed for effective nutrition education in schools? How do we create competences that are um, highlighting the need for changes in practices and behaviors and food choices? Um, what does the curriculum need to include based on these action-based competences and not knowledge-based competences only? 
what are the models and methods for this um, to, uh, to reach these competences? Which are the strategies that are being used and what innovation can be brought in uh, nutrition education in schools, especially when there is a, when the resource allocation is is very limited, when the food security situation is is a, of concern. So, what are the most innovative uh, strategies in that sense? Um, what are the capacities needed along the school system? And then um, there is not a lot of monitoring, evaluation, or research, as I mentioned before. So basically, theme eight is about. Uh, some easy indicators on how to promote um, low-cost monitoring and evaluation, and what are the research gaps. Um, so at the moment, our next steps are the finalization and dissemination of the, of the package of outputs that I was mentioning, um, the publication of a policy guidance that follows more the school food uh, approach that I uh, mentioned at the beginning. Then we are thinking about creating a multi-UN agency working group on nutrition education in schools to understand what are the needs and what are the, the areas where we can work together. And continue, of course, the, the support to countries and regional initiatives. Um, and then further identification and establishment of partnerships. So thank you on behalf of FAO's task force and nutrition education team for your time. Great, thank you very much, Melissa. Um, and we're going to come back for questions or comments about the uh, the remarks being made by the UN agencies at the end of the comments made by the agencies. So I'm going to um, ask if there's anybody from UNICEF here. I had anticipated that uh, Roland would be with us, um, but I see a couple of people who may may be coming from UNICEF. If you are, if you could just click on your mic and say hello, and and if you'd like to add a, a couple of words about your the work you're doing in this area, that would be much appreciated. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to go over to our colleagues from uh, WHO um, in alphabetical order. Juana is uh, online, I see, and we have a couple of other colleagues. So uh, Juana or colleagues, do you want to just uh, tell us a little bit about the work you've been doing in this area and um, anything relevant to the focus on low resource countries? Thanks very much, Doug. Um, yeah, I, I will speak on behalf of a number of different colleagues. Some some are on duty travel, but I think we also have Kaya and uh, Krista on the line, and uh, they, they will be able to answer any questions specifically on topics if need be. I'm just going to try and share my screen. Okay. Oh, I need to make you a presenter. Hang okay. on. Uh, let me just okay. do that. Let me find you in the list here. Oops. Okay, you should be able to share now. Okay, is that? It takes a while to load up a bit, I think. Okay, sorry. Anyway, just to start, just to say that the, the second global nutrition policy review was completed last year, and there's actually a draft of the final report um, available online at the moment. And that had responses from 172 member states. Um, and the results, um, if the slide comes up, you'll be able to see them. But the results are basically that there has been a decline in reported implementation in school uh, nutrition policies and programs since the last Global Nutrition Policy Review in 2009-2010, um, which is, is a Juan, if I could just interrupt, I think we're seeing yeah. two, two slides. Um, if you look on your screen, um, you've got a, a, a black, there we go, perfect. Okay, sorry. Um, so there you can see the, 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 the programs that were reported in this last global nutrition policy review. Um, and the, the blue bars are the programs that are aimed specifically at reducing or preventing child undernutrition, stunting, wasting, and micronutrient deficiencies. And the red bars are the ones that are focusing on preventing childhood overweight or obesity. Obviously, there's a difference in the different regions across WHO, but in general, there's been a shift towards more objectives um, focusing on overweight and obesity in the second policy review. But as I was saying, generally a decline in the reported implementation, which is of particular concern. 
WHO, together with UNICEF, uh, FAO, World Food Programme, and UNESCO, and a number of other bilateral and civil society partners, have um, a nutrition-friendly schools initiative, which is part of the health promoting schools and addresses particularly undernutrition and, and over, overweight and obesity. Um, we're currently finalizing uh, an review of the evidence underpinning the Nutrition Friendly Schools Initiative framework, and that, that work will be completed very soon. And that, again, will just really review with the current state of evidence um, how the particular elements of the Nutrition Friendly Schools Initiative um, are, are being uh, implemented and, and what the criteria would be for, for assessing those. And the reason that there's a, a lot of renewed interest in this particular area is particularly focusing on the report of the Commission on Ending Childhood Obesity, which was welcomed by the World Health Assembly uh, two years ago. And they, they've taken a life course approach, um, but made a particular emphasis on school-aged children, recognizing that there are children who unfortunately do not attend school, but seeing schools as a potential vehicle for really implementing comprehensive programs that will promote healthy food consumption, physical activity, and improve health and nutrition literacy for lifelong life skills um, in children and adolescents. And this slide just summarizes the, the full set of recommendations in Recommendation 5. There are a number of them, but this just summarizes and puts some of them together, uh, with the focus on in particular on setting standards for meals provided and sold in schools, eliminating the provision and sale of unhealthy foods and drinks. And this also links uh, to some of the recommendations in recommendation one of the report on the commission about restricting marketing of unhealthy foods and beverages to children, including within schools. Um, that includes the promotion of, of those products within schools, um, the sponsorship of either school supplies or school sporting events by unhealthy foods and drinks, uh, and the provision of vending machines, for example, that carry marketing and, and promotional materials. They also made a recommendation specifically about increasing the availability of drinking water in schools and sports facilities and making that freely available as an alternative to some of those unhealthy sugar sweetened beverages. They had a particular emphasis on the importance of nutrition and health education, and that this should be um, within the core curriculum, uh, and to also improve the nutrition literacy and the skills for children and for their parents and families and carers, uh, including, for example, cookery lessons, um, both for children and parents. And they, they had, in addition, a, a particular recommendation on quality physical education. So in terms of how WHO are carrying this work forward, um, I wonder if I could just give you an example of a, a meeting that I was attending last week in the Southeast Asian region, where we brought together four countries that were particularly interested in working on nutrition and physical activity within the school environment. And this was Bangladesh, Maldives, Sri Lanka, and Thailand who came together for a first meeting of what may potentially be a network of countries in the Southeast Asia region to, to really um, think what particular elements of nutrition and diet within schools and physical activity within schools they would like to focus on um, and, and where joint work across countries may actually have added benefits and um, produce greater results. And this was a, a really interesting working group, bringing together representatives from ministries of health and ministries of education. Uh, we also had somebody from the World Food Programme in Bangladesh. Uh, we had some NGOs and also some academics from the various different countries. And they, they workshopped around the different areas of work that they could see uh, as potential for taking forward. And the, the, the areas of work that came out in particular were setting standards for, for meals provided and sold in schools, restricting marketing and promotion of unhealthy foods and beverages within the school environment, and they were even keen to, to extend that to beyond the school gate, and um, improving the, the implementation of nutrition and health education in addition to quality physical education within, within schools. And so this, this group 
it was a very preliminary meeting. Um, they've now gone back to their respective countries uh, and are consulting further with, with authorities to see what form um, such a network could take um, and how this work could contribute to revitalizing some of the health promoting school initiatives in that region um, and giving extra impetus to some of that work. And so that's that's going to be an ongoing piece of work that I think will be very interesting in which which we will very much share with other UN agencies and the Fresh Network. Unfortunately, the representative from UNESCO who we had invited was unable to attend at the very last minute. Um, but I think this, this could be an interesting model for bringing countries together in order to help them work on a set of activities um, that will support them in terms of policy implementation um, back in their respective countries. Um, in terms of other work that, that's ongoing, that's the most, most recent uh, activities that we have. We also have under development some tools to help teachers in delivering uh, life skills education and particularly focusing on diet and physical activity that, that are currently under development with some colleagues. And I think if there are any particular questions, especially on the Global Nutrition Policy Review and the Nutrition Friendly Schools Initiative, I think Kaya is hopefully on the line and we'll be able to, to answer any of those. Thank you. Excellent, Monita. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask um, if we could have remarks, and um, Monita, if you can, um, Juan or rather, can you can just stop sharing your screen if, so that uh, there you go. we can have, perfect, uh, if we can have, um, I'm not sure who from a World Food Program uh, would take the lead, and, and if you have slides, please let me know so I can make you a presenter, but otherwise, um, David or colleagues, which one, who would you like to uh, start the conversation? Yes, thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Duke. Uh, I, I don't have slides, but let me start, and then I will uh, hand over to uh, Mutinta uh, and to my colleague here also, Emily Sidaner, who is the lead author of uh, a, a very important publication called Smart School Meals in Latin America. So let me start uh, by um, confirming that WFP recognized schools as powerful platform to achieve SDG 2 and particularly SDG 2.2, ending all forms of malnutrition with the aim of uh, reducing childhood overweight. Um, I think it's really important. You know that WFP is providing a meal uh, every day to almost 17 million children in 69 countries and providing technical support to national government-led school meal program impacting indirectly 45 million children with our technical assistance. And, and also we support homegrown school meals in 46 countries. I'd like to highlight here uh, uh, an important initiative that we have jointly with FAO, with IFAD, with uh, GCNF, the Global uh, Child Nutrition Foundation, Arlene Mitchell, with PCD, Partner for Child Development, Leslie Drake, and uh, WFP Center of Excellence in Brazil around homegrown school meal program. Uh, we are jointly developing a resource framework to help government to increase uh, the sourcing of the food from small farmers. Uh, and improving local value chains by being more nutrition sensitive so that more fresh ingredients and nutritious ingredients can be served in school. Uh, and the fact that it's a joint work uh, that what we are developing and we will publish that resource framework in, in two months, I think it's, it's a very important initiative here. Um, to to increase the sourcing from farmers and, and fresh food and diversifying the, the diet. Uh, we all know that school feeding is the largest safety net in the world, so it's a very important entry point for addressing multi forms of malnutrition uh, by provision of nutritious meals, improving diet diversity, 
supporting behavior change, nutrition education, but also uh, having the school as a platform linking it to other services with a, an essential package of intervention approach, including health, dewarming, uh, and helping also to improve the nutrition status of preschool children, uh, but as well targeting adolescent and adolescent girls uh, in particular. Um, WFP is very much engaged also in uh, nutrition education and SBCC, social behavior change communication. I will let Mutinta uh, tell us more about it. Uh, but also we support policy and enabling environment, uh, specifically with what we call the feed nutrient gap and cost of diet analysis, uh, which is looking actually at uh, optimizing the composition of the menu uh, for uh, the different target groups uh, that WFP is also applying for school age children, uh, preschoolers and adolescents. Uh, all of that to be able to address the double burden of malnutrition uh, in the different context uh, and improve the school environment to promote access to healthy food uh, and uh, beverage, providing also a safe environment and uh, assuring food safety, uh, which is important for us, uh, making the linkages with local community and supporting policy. We see many opportunities actually to address the specific needs of the different age group uh, for school interventions, uh, in particular for pre-primary and adolescent children who have different nutrient requirements depending on the age and gender, uh, and opportunity also to enhance the micronutrient content of the food. Uh, and very often the food served in school is actually the uh, only very nutritious food that could be consumed in the day for too many children, especially when we think of uh, vitamin A, iron and zinc that uh, should be produced, um, supplied by, by nutritious food, improving the nutrition education tailored to age group, uh, the BCC targeting specific behaviors, but also strengthening monitoring and evaluation system uh, with a need to have uh, nutrition related indicators specific to school age children that are uh, not sufficiently included. Uh, and, and also to uh, frame and design school meals as part of a national social protection system uh, with better linkages to other complementary interventions, uh, also conditional cash transfer. So I'd like to uh, suggest to Mutinta to uh, highlight the work she's doing on the nutrition sensitive programming and its relevance also to a school meal program uh, and, and promotion of healthy food choice and diet to prevent uh, overweight and obesity. Over to you, Mutinta. And then I will ask uh, uh, Emily to talk about the publication in, in, uh, in South America. Over to you, Mutinta. Thank you, David. Um, I'll be brief because I think you've touched most of the points. Um, what I wanted to emphasize also is the fact that um, following the new nutrition policy for World Food Program, which is between which which is from 2017 to 2021, there's a lot of emphasis on making all programs in WFP nutrition sensitive, including uh, school feeding. Therefore. You know, we've been working to ensure that, um, you know, we, we, we understand how do we, how do we, you know, increase the nutrient intake of the, the, the foods that children are taking, as well as how do we change behaviors. And as mentioned, we've been working with different, um, uh, partners, but perhaps what, what we've uh, realized so far is that, um, you know, there are gaps around the situation analysis. Uh, most of the countries that we go to, particularly those dealing with undernutrition, they are still talking about stunting, for example, in the school age group. So there's definitely a, a gap in identifying what the nutrition issues are in the school age group. Um, we do have a few the nutrient gap tool, uh, an analytical tool, which now allows us to understand the different nutrient requirements um, for 
the different uh, age groups, uh, particularly, of course, early adolescents, adolescent children, as well as um, much older. So we have uh, that too. We've uh, applied that too in uh, Madagascar, for example, and we were able to show the differences in terms of what the schools, uh, school age group require. Um, we are looking to promote data diversity, as, the, as uh, David mentioned, and um, really trying to understand, uh, you know, the extent to which that is possible and what the options are. I was I was in Zimbabwe last week, uh, try also you know on a mission trying to understand, you know, school feeding in that uh, in in that country, including you know other areas of the portfolio, and um, it was very clear that you know the kids are just receiving, for example, maize or a porridge. And therefore, if we are looking to address the nutrient requirements of this age group, I think, you know, there's quite uh, some work to do in terms of diversifying the diet. Um, I think that's all really that I wanted to add, that the analysis needs to be strengthened, and we are looking at that. Uh, we are also, you know, having gaps in the indicators, but we believe that given the platform that we have, you know, reaching about, you know, reaching different contexts, we can work together to promote certain uh, indicators that would better describe the situation among this age group. Thank you. I'll pass on to Emily. Good afternoon. Uh, we just wanted to present uh, the, the publication we did in 2017 about school meals programs in Latin America and uh, the efforts that are me being made to make them more nutrition sensitive. And something important to bear in mind is that in, in Latin America, we're really talking about government programs. The governments pay and, and, and implement the programs. And uh, the first thing that uh, that's an obvious statement, but still, is that in Latin America, really the uh, overweight and obesity rates are surging, including among the school age population. And so, uh, Addressing uh, overweight through school-based interventions and through school meals is really an important uh, preoccupation for governments. So it's something that's very high in, in their agenda when, when talking about school meals. And uh, there's a strong conviction that uh, school meals can contribute to, to overweight preventions by two ways in the short term by uh, helping to diversify the diets and uh, uh, promoting access to fresh and healthier foods to which the school children might not have access to in, in their homes. And secondly, in the long term, uh, by promoting lasting uh, eating habits um, that, that can then uh, trickle down to, to the communities and, and to the next generation. But uh, at the same time, uh, the the concern is also making sure that school meals programs are are not only part of the solution, but more than anything, are not part of the problem. And uh, the starting point was that in, in many countries, the school meals programs actually were designed years ago to address uh, on the nutrition and the stunting, and uh, and so there's really a policy shift. Uh, in, in the region to make sure that uh, that the menus and the food provided in schools does not uh, contribute to the problem. But it's it's a slow evolution with some countries being really at the forefront, like Brazil, Mexico, who revamped completely their programs some years ago, and other countries that are are just uh, starting addressing the and this issue. Many of, uh, of the recommendations and findings from this study uh, have been already mentioned. The importance of the quality of the food basket and ensuring it's diversified, but also provides adequate levels of uh, all the nutrients children need. Uh, related to that, uh, developing supply chains that promote uh, food diversity and homegrown school feeding approaches um, that help to do that, and here it's it's really going beyond just looking at uh, at food baskets, but also uh, at how the the food is procured. Because if you want to include 
uh, fresh food, it, it means for many countries completely rethinking their supply approach to, to source as close to the school as possible to allow the provision of, of perishable foods in contexts where there is no cold chain. Um, uh, and that's important because it means that actually diversifying the food baskets to, to contribute to promote uh, a healthy diets has a cost. Uh, and has food safety uh, implications also, and, and bears a, uh, a lot of, uh, of new areas of work related to, to food safety, and I'll come back to that later. Um, there's, of course, Mutinta, you talked about uh, monitoring and evaluation and setting the right indicators and collecting the data, and, and, and indeed, many countries are developing programs, but there's not a clear understanding of the needs and the situation. Uh, the work is broader and looking at uh, the food environment and the food being sold in the school premises or the food available around school premises and, and there's really a need for, for an overall approach and uh, I can say here that UNICEF who contributed to that publication has been doing some work on, uh, on the school food environments in, in some countries in Latin America that can be a, an interesting thing to look at as well. Uh, and so uh, we also looked at the we also looked at the policy environment and the enabling environment. And uh, here, those those points have been raised uh, already. But the importance of of the policy environment and uh, and really the the W2 re review on uh, on policies is, is really interesting. I, I hope we can have a. Uh, a closer look at that, but uh, indeed um, countries are shifting their policies related to uh, to health uh, and uh, and uh, school-based platforms. But uh, but this is a, a slow a slow process. The importance of interagency coordination and uh, the issue of cost containment and optimizing and the efficiency of programs so that they can really uh, provide fresh and healthier foods in, in the long term. So may, many of these issues have been uh, really echoed in, in the conversations we, we had so far. I just wanted to, to add that uh, from our knowledge, the Latin American region is really at the forefront of on these issues, but other regions are, are also starting to look uh, very closely at these issues. And so WFP is working uh, currently with Jordan, for instance, in uh, uh, to to help them shift their school needs program to provide the, a healthier food basket that includes fresh fruits and vegetables on a daily basis to school children. In Lebanon, we are supporting a program where, uh, again, rather than the nutrients new energy dense food we provide milk and fresh food so it's it's really a, an important trend uh, but uh, so far there's no there hasn't been any uh, impact evaluation that allows to to measure the impact on uh, on overweight and obesity and that's perhaps the next uh, mile thank you Excellent. Thank you very much, Emily, and, and um, thank you to all of our participants. Um, I see that Jiang Feng from uh, UNESCO was in on the meeting shortly, uh, briefly. He um, obviously had to go, but um, any discussions that uh, we'll proceed with, um, UNESCO is an active partner in the FRESH partnership, and so we'll make sure that they are uh, invited as well to any subsequent conversations. And there probably are other organizations that you all work with that you think should also be involved as well. And, and a couple of coordinating mechanisms I see in, in as I've wandered through the research and the reports and resources that uh, already exist, that, so it doesn't have to be the FRESH partnership that... Um, facilitates this whatever is whatever works best um, just to uh, make a note uh, before we uh, ask for comments or questions uh, that uh, please send me any documents uh, uh, that you think need to be shared uh, and I will post them on the website that's showing in the chat box there it's on the fresh partners website and uh, there's a list of webinars and the webinar recordings um, so just to um, uh, ask if there are any questions or comments on the um, 
on the remarks made by our UN agency colleagues. Um, and uh, I see Jane has started that a bit with one comment asking about the connection between school meals and school food education. How do we strengthen, uh, how does that connection made and strengthened? Um, but uh, first, uh, you know, just click on your mic and ask a question or make a comment. And uh, maybe uh, the, our colleagues from the UN agencies could, could uh, respond to Jane's uh, initial question. I see that uh, that Laura has also um, uh, expressed an interest in that too. That's great. So making the connection uh, between the different components. Um, further discussion, comments. Uh, yes. Yeah, so some. I'm not sure who Jane Sherman is, but that that's a, a very good question. Thank you. Because in in fact the link might not be that clear, but. First, what we what we see in Latin America, but also in other regions, is that uh, school meals can, and I'm not saying it's always the case, uh, but school meals have proven to to have the potential to be a platform for nutrition education. So in Latin America, several programs, school meal programs, are uh, are part of an integrated approach that includes uh, nutrition education and and discussion around the food that is provided. In Jordan, for instance, in the schools where fresh fruit and vegetables are provided, the, the national organization with which we work um, does provide nutrition training and nutrition education to all the stakeholders, from the food, to the people involved in the distribution of the meals, the teachers, the children. In Lebanon, the, in the schools where we support school meals again, where it's a fresh piece of fruit and, and milk, the partner that we work with uh, facilitates summer camps during the school holidays that are all around nutrition education and nutrition promotion. So the same kids that receive the meals uh, participate in these summer camps, receive the meals in the summer camps, and have a specific nutrition education sessions and games, etc. Uh, around that. So it's part of an integrated approach, but, uh, but it has to be, it doesn't happen by coincidence. It has to be part of, uh, of an integrated approach and that calls for, uh, for uh, comprehensive policy and, plan, um, and careful program design. And it's certainly something we have to, to further develop. Excellent. Thank you for that response. Uh, further comments or questions, either in the chat box or if you'd like to um, to add your, um, just click on the mic and, and add your thoughts. It, it doesn't uh, have to be directly a response to the to the present the remarks that have been made by our colleagues from the UN agencies. Um, this just challenge of addressing um, uh, low resource countries as a context and preventing overweight and and promoting healthy food choices as as the focus. Further comments? Um, yeah, Doug, I want just to to uh, add on to to that discussion specifically. We found that uh, in in many countries that linkage was not explicit, and um, many times we we saw that when uh, the countries tried to incorporate nutrition education into their school meal programs. Uh, actually, what what was happening was was very uh, not. It was uh, one one thing was happening in the meal room in the with the meals, and another thing was happening in the classroom. So, uh, we, this is one of the the main linkages that we're trying very hard to to strengthen. We have seen examples of high income countries that they are explicitly using the meal time as a learning opportunity, and. Uh, having a very good linkage of what's happening inside the classroom and outside. But we have seen that the majority of, of, of examples are not that explicit and are, are actually not uh, doing this, even in the thematic content, even in the, in, for example, the content of the school meals and what is uh, taught in the classroom, uh, even the connection with the, with the household, um, the connection with the parents and the connection with the food service staff. Uh, we, ha we have seen that, that many times the nutrition education for food service staff is mostly for, for um, food safety and for generalities of nutrition rather than actually connecting the, the school meals 
with uh, healthy practices. So this is one of the, the, um, the areas that we would really like to explore with other UN agencies on how uh, this, this, they see these examples and, and which explicit examples do they have that we could share. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Melissa. Further comments, questions? Yeah, I'd like to add to that just um, one, little, one little thing. Um, is that okay? Yes, go um, ahead. Just since I happen to be grappling with, the, with, with how to devise a curriculum which actually works in four, four, four schools in lower middle income countries, and um, I've never understood why school meals are not actually included as a topic in the curriculum. Um, now, it doesn't have to be actually done by the, by, the, by the education ministry, but it can always be done by an intervening agency like WFP or whoever, you know, but they can take it out of the, out of the curriculum so that it, 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 it's actually done by somebody else. Um, it, it, I, I, just, I, I just would like to sort of consider the possibility of looking at the whole thing from the point of view of the inside of the child's mind rather than from the point of view of his stomach. Do you see what I mean? I mean, <laughs> the school meals are addressing his stomach. What goes into his head when he eats a good school meal? That's what I want to know. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Comments and responses to that. And um, we have another question from Ashira. What do you find works best for, to engage volunteers to run meal programs in, in uh, schools? So further comments and questions? Um. Um, good, uh, good morning, Doug and colleagues. My name is Mary Gwendolini. I'm from the Regional Office for Education uh, of UNESCO in Santiago, Chile. Um, I'm sorry to have joined so late because the conversation really sounds directly relevant to a project that we're just starting uh, with FAO. and it, it uh, has to do with exactly some of the things I've already heard mentioned, the link between um, or the non-link between school feeding programs and uh, nutrition education as it's incorporated into uh, the official curriculum and, of course, co-curricular co activities as well. Um, we're, we're just starting, um, so I'd be interested in keeping uh, touch with all of you and telling you more about this because um, as is clear, there are so many issues involved here from public health, from education, from nutrition, from curricular development, and, uh, physical education, that we're, um, uh, we're struggling a bit to find, uh, find the right nexus between, between all of these in such a way as we can come up with specific suggestions for strengthening uh, curricular and also some of the evalua evaluation issues are on our uh, list for uh, this project, which runs through the end of uh, 2018. So uh, thanks for the chance, and I'm excited to be part of this group. Thank you. Thank you, Mary again. Uh, thank you. And, and um, I'm looking at the comments, other further comments. I think um, we've been online for an hour, and that's our usual stopping point. Uh, but I did want to close with a little bit more uh, detail about the next steps. Um, I'll just give a chance for final comments or questions from participants, any invitations. As I've noted, uh, please do send me any documents or initiatives, links to initiatives that you uh, may want to share directly, and we'll put them on the FRESH website as noted. Um, so uh, this has been a good start to a conversation, and I think we have uh, definitely identified a topic of shared interest. Uh, I see uh, Olivia is... Um, working as, a, as PAHO for, um, uh, in, in Central America as well. Um, and, uh, and so a question there specifically about Central America is to know if the initiative is working there in those countries. So um, just to allow for a chance to that, for that, a response to that question or further comments about the general topic of promoting um, healthy food choices, healthy diet in in low resource countries. Um, and that's one of the questions that Ashir is asking is how to strengthen partnerships and open school boards uh, in, in, to do this kind of work. And uh, we have a comment from Margarita from Save the Children in El Salvador. I'm looking at interesting how any initiative addresses um, healthy food choices 
through a more comprehensive in integrated approach. Uh, it seems, um, and again, in Al Servita, they're piloting a program uh, that's including a number of different interventions, uh, as she's um, as she's noted in her post. And uh, again, uh, the question of coordination and, and and linking the different interventions is is coming up. Comments from for as we begin to to try to close the, uh, the session. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for all the exchange. My name is Olivia Brathwaite. I'm working for PAHO WHO as a sub-regional advisor for Central America and Dominican Republic in NCDs. And we are trying to, to um, how you can say, to strengthen the sub-regional network for healthy schools. So I think that this fresh initiative is wonderful. And I'm just new. This is my first meeting with you guys. And I will try to keep in contact more often. And um, I would like to know all the initiatives that are have been doing in this do it in this sub-region. And I would like to um, to use the resources of the network um, to strengthen this this network of healthy school that we are trying to establish this year and the next year. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity. There is my email in the in the in the in the chat, and let's keep in touch. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, further comments or questions? Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to maybe close with a couple of comments about uh, the next steps that uh, we're able to take as part of this particular session. Um, as you uh, know, Fresh has been sponsoring a series of webinars on low resource countries, not only the nutrition issues, but several other issues. Although we have had several sessions on um, school food programs in different contexts uh, or in different countries, which has been excellent. Uh, I'd invite you to go to that uh, web page uh, on webinars on the Fresh Partners website for the recordings and uh, to learn about the discussions that we have been having. Our, our goal in, in promoting a discussion about low resource countries um, is, um, is, is one to, trying to get a more of a community of practice, a global conversation focused on that type of context. Uh, as you know, uh, most uh, research and program development is often done in high resource countries. And um, in, there's been a, a strong interest and a really good leadership from an a, the interagency network on education and emergencies that have that has drawn uh, good attention, urgent attention is needed to the conflict and disaster affected countries. So Fresh is trying to, to bring a focus to this particular context and to encourage more of a more knowledge sharing, more knowledge development, more research in this area. And nutrition is an important step in that. Um, our international school health network has been able to work with um, Plan International out of the UK to be able to extend that conversation a bit by pr producing a, a summary. And uh, you'll see the links to that summary uh, as it develops on the um, in the webinar page as well. And I'm not sure if you're seeing what I'm uh, I'm having trouble sharing my screen, but the um, the outline we're using has got a number of different components, many of which has has um, come up today. Um, the uh, if you're seeing a screen, the the fourth element of really building multi-component approaches or multi-intervention programs um, is is one of the key elements of of what we're looking at, and and it obviously from today's discussion is one of the the key issues that we're going to need to 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 look at more closely in this context as we move forward. But the the outline that we use in this kind of investigation is fairly extensive and it does touch on many of the issues that have been addressed in the various documents and initiatives that have been described by the UN agencies. Um, one of the ones that I'd maybe like to highlight a little bit is one that looks at um, how educators and how educational systems respond to these kinds of issues. Um, the, 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 uh, the overload and the reluctance sometimes of of education sector, uh, the education sector, and the capacity of the education sector to be able to respond is really important to consider. Um, and uh, another kind of approach, which goes really well with the conversations that seem to be emerging about food systems, is the idea of using a systems-based approach. Um, we're often focused on our day-to-day -day, uh, implementation of a particular program on a particular issue, which is has to be done, uh, but seeing how that fits within a broader system 
and um, and recognizing that schools are part of education systems and so they are governed and controlled and funded by by uh, systems that have their own their own needs and their own considerations and their own priorities and so that's the kind of, of uh, consideration that might also be uh, of interest to future discussions so I, I'm going to um, to um, close off with um, that invitation to uh, I will be sending out um, and I'll note the participants here the uh, the updated uh, we've just posted the outline uh, in the Google document that we did post uh, we'll produce that summary uh, pu publish that summary in the next uh, uh, week or two and then ask for comments on it uh, my sense based on what we found in that review as well as from the excellent presentations today is that this is a, a very well developed uh, sector you're all doing really amazing work that um, is addressing this issue in a general way and I think many of the organizations are now beginning to focus on this particular context and so it's it's very heartening to see uh, I was quite impressed with the the not, not only the relevance but the recent dates of the various publications and initiatives um, on this topic it's it's very exciting to see that the UN agencies are really um, focused on this and moving forward with recent events and, and, and initiatives and documents and research and so on. So if, if we can, if the Fresh Group can help um, share those um, or if we can move forward in, in organizing a, maybe an ongoing series of discussions about school nutrition, then uh, we would be happy to help in some way. Uh, so I'm going to ask if any of the uh, other, uh, any other further comments um, uh, questions or uh, suggestions about other steps we should be taking uh, and then we'll, we'll finish up the session um, after that. So further su suggestions or comments from any of the UN agency colleagues or from anybody else. Please um, please add your comments now and then we'll, we'll finish up the session. Okay, silence means assent. <laughs> and uh, uh, Doug, sorry, can I say something? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so thank you a lot for uh, organizing this webinar. I think that this was eye-opening to to hear from all the very similar work that we are doing and, and in all the UN agencies. And I think that this is a great opportunity for us and for for everyone to to see where we can uh, build stronger linkages and to avoid. Um, duplication and to, to strengthen our work. Do you think it will be, I'm sorry if I missed that, can, can we circulate the contacts of the people that were in this call? Yes, I think so. If not, could everybody please send me your email address to, uh, mine's been posted, but it's dmccall at internationalschoolhealth.org. Um, and, um, and then we'll uh, post a list and start this conversation. And we, we already have uh, about 15 different experts, many of whom could not make it today, most of them who could not make it today, but they're also interested in being part of this conversation. So um, I think we're going to have a group, a, a quite a good uh, starting group for this kind of sharing of over 30 or 40 people. So. Great, thank you. Excellent. Yes, uh Go ahead. Thank you. I also would like to thank this opportunity. We are looking forward to strengthen the connection between agencies, at least in this region. As we know, um, in the 2011, we have a UN declaration regarding the prevention and control trying to stop NCDs. And one of these uh, issues, the health healthy schools, food in schools is one of the issues. So we are trying to connect all the agencies in this region to establish a group, a multi-sectoral group that is working towards achieving not only um, the, the um, sustainable development goal number two, but number three as well, especially 3.4. So thanks for this opportunity. Please share all the contacts and we will keep in touch. We will start a consultation around June or May so maybe I will send the survey to you as well, to all the guys that works in Central America to have your background in these topics. Thank you. Bye. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, then. Thank you very much, everybody, for participating. I'm going to just close off.